with me when I'm Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton, to those here in the sanctuary, to those online, and to whoever might be watching later. You are stronger because you are with us. We are all stronger because we are with us. My name is Lynn Turvey. My pronouns are she, her. My name is John Turvey. My pronouns are he and him. Uh, Team Turvey uh, will <laughs> will be your service leader today. Uh, we, along with Reverend Rosemary Morrison, uh, hope that you will find respite and fulfillment in our shared fellowship. Um, <laughs> thank you to everyone who has made this service possible. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is one of two Unitarian Universalist churches in Edmonton, the other being Westwood. Unitarian Universalism celebrates a spirituality where you can bring your whole self, your full identity, your questioning mind, your expansive heart. We travel together on a journey that honors everywhere we've been before. We are all growing, all learning, all loved. Just as you are, you are welcome here. If you are new here, we invite you to stay for coffee and fellowship following the service. If you have not already done so, please visit our newcomer table in the lobby. There will be useful information for you there about our movement and our community. Our community extends beyond this Sunday morning gathering we have a monthly newsletter available online, and you can join our virtual community on Facebook. We begin our gathering, acknowledging that we are located on Treaty 6 territory. We respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. I believe this morning we have some announcements. I think Donna and Jan may be the first ones up. Thank you both. <laughs> Beat me. <laughs> oh, good morning. And. <laughs> My name is Donna Hammer, and um, I'm here to talk a little bit about the garage sale. I could probably do the whole sermon on it, <laughs> but we'll... we'll go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of stories, but mainly just to let you know that Team UCE and Friends did it again. We had a very successful garage sale. Thanks to all of you who pulled together and pushed through, well, aches, pains, hives, colds, you name it. <laughs> Everything came up. First of all, how many people donated? Put your hands up. Donated to the, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. How many cooked for the workers? Lots there too. And how many um, um, bought, worked? We'll do work first. Look at that. Practically every hand. And how many bought something? <laughs> there, we've covered everybody. <laughs> okay, I'm not, we had great help, and I'm not going to mention names because there were so many, and of course I'll leave somebody out. Um, but I will write something up in the newsletter. Um, but today, I just want to thank you and say congratulations and announce that we cleared over 12,000. Well, 
and we're still counting. Just goes to show that I have to say that my sister did a better job than I. I never got to the 12,000 when I was running it. Everything's going up these years. <laughs> we charge more. <laughs> So I would like to say that um, we still have an opportunity to make more money. You can get a bag of books and CDs for a toonie. You can get everything in there for half price and uh, be happy to, uh, in case you thought that you were going to use your money to put in the collection plate, you still can because I can charge anything that you buy. Oh, one other thing. We are doing a cleanup on Tuesday morning from 10 till it gets done. Uh, I don't expect it'll take long. Uh, we need, if you're available, to come and give us a couple of hours of your help on Tuesday morning. That would be awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Jan and Donna. I just have to say this quickly before the next announcement people come up, but I was there helping a few times. Um, not as many hours as many of you put in, but I just must say when I came and I watched and I saw the amount of preparation, planning, organizing, and sheer physical work that went into that is astounding. It really is. So I think they deserve more than a round of applause, but let's give the crew a round of applause anyway. Uh, Alara, I think you have an announcement. Good morning, my name is Alara, my pronouns are they, them. I have a couple of announcements regarding Canoodle, our big national youth conference that's coming up in two weeks? Yeah. Two weeks! So I have, for those of you who have agreed to do overnights, thank you so much. I have volunteer forms for you to fill out. If I haven't found you yet, please come find me after the service. That's the first part of my announcement. And then the second part of my announcement is that our youthers are going to be coming from all over the country and travel is difficult and getting more and more expensive. So if there are any of you that could lend sleeping things, so like camping mats, sleeping bags, pillows, what have you, the Thursday before there will be canoodle staff here in the building. That would be the perfect time to bring it, but if you want to bring stuff anytime between now and that Friday, which is the 18th, 17th or 18th, that Friday, pardon? 17th is the Friday, so if you could bring stuff, put your name on it so that we can match the things that have been lent to the conference back to the humans. Um, that would be super appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Alara. I believe Erica also has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. My name is Erica Deneve. My pronouns are she, they. I actually have two announcements, sort of related, uh, with new things that we are going to be doing. We are going to start hosting a trans queer potluck once a month here at the church. Uh, it's going to be on the fourth Sunday of every month. And so that's going to start this month on the 26th. It will be right after services. And it will be in for now until it gets so big that we have to do it somewhere else. Uh, it will be in the large classroom. That's classroom number two. So um, we will have more details in the newsletter and possibly on the Facebook if I can get myself together technology-wise. Don't hold your breath, but other people will be helping. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, so yes, we will have more details about that coming up. And uh, we are also looking at uh, trying to do something regularly for a labyrinth walk. Um, also looking at doing a once a month labyrinth walk for people who are interested both within and outside of the church. Um, that will most likely be on a Friday evening, also once a month. Uh, looking at probably starting that in August, right Audrey? 
we're looking at an August start for that. Um, more details to come on that as well. If you are interested in either of those things, please come find me after the service. I will be out in the foyer and we can exchange information and talk about it more. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. And Reverend Rosemary has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison. My pronouns are she, her, and I am here to remind you that there is an AGM right after the service. So get your coffee and come back into the service, into the sanctuary. Uh, please stay for the AGM. We need to make sure that um, your voice is heard and that you get a vote. So make sure you're here right after the service. Come on back or as Gordon said last week, come on down. Great, thanks everyone. <clears throat> now, please take a moment to quiet any devices and let's enjoy a time of contemplation as we listen to a Buddhist chanting from the Dadak region of India. I now invite Sylvia to come forward to light our chalice as we hear these words by Vietnamese Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh. Sylvia, if you could come forward. Walk as if you are kissing the earth with your feet. Sometimes your joy is the source of your smile, and sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. Because you are alive, everything is possible. You must love in such a way that the person you love feels free. If you love someone, the greatest gift you can give them is your presence. Thank you, Sylvia. Our first hymn, our opening hymn, is number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are, in the gray hymnal, if you have a hymnal, and the text will appear on the screen behind me. And please rise as you are willing and able for hymn number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. It's now time to share the abundance we are so privileged to enjoy. Uh, may I have two people to circulate the offering plates, please? We know that financial contributions to this self-sustaining congregation have come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and our world than they would have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life of this congregation. May we give in love and hope. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to uh, the wider community. And one half of the unidentified cash we've received is given to an outside organization. For the month of May, we are supporting, yes, youth empowerment and support services in Edmonton. 
providing support, programs, housing and resources to youth who are lost, abandoned, without a place to turn for over 35 years. Over 60,000 meals are served annually to this high needs group. YES needs $6 million annually to stay up and running, and one half of that amount comes from donations. You can visit their website, yess.org, to learn more. Please join in singing from You I Receive as the offering is brought forward. Morning again. Lynn and I have enjoyed and learned much from our exploration of the profound teachings of Buddhism. I would like to share some insights with you about both the role of community in Buddhism and the role of Buddhism in community. I would like to reflect on Sangha, one of the three jewels of Buddhism the community of practicing Buddhists who are committed to the Dharma and the wisdom and the way of the Eightfold Path. It seems to me as though I am being guided and encouraged on the Buddhist path by the words and examples of those around me. For instance, as I chatted recently with a new friend here at the UCE, where's Chantel? Oh. Um, she mentioned that one of her favorite phrases was, this too shall pass. I, I was soon to find that this theme of impermanence is articulated in the Nirodha, the third noble truth, the Buddhist wisdom that suffering can end, that things change, and this too is part of our journey. I found it interesting that profound Buddhist teachings can be so embedded in familiar phrases uttered by friends who may not themselves be practicing Buddhists. As I reflected more on similar, incident, similar incidental brushes with Buddhism in my life, I recalled a pivotal moment during my undergraduate years. Usually an exciting time of academic exploration and intellectual development, my experience was overshadowed by the memories of recent workplace bullying. The emotional pain clouded my mind, robbing it of peace and hindering my studies. A fellow student offered me simple yet life-changing advice. Forgive them. Her words, delivered with such conviction, struck a chord. When I embraced forgiveness, grudgingly at first, and then wholeheartedly and genuinely, I regained my peace of mind, which led to, among other things, the, fulfillment, the, uh, the fulfilling teaching career that I am grateful for today. This act of forgiveness was my first unconscious uh, step on a path remarkably similar to the Buddhist way, a path that advocates for letting go of the grips of past injuries and the burdens of sustained anger. Unbeknownst to me, the simple act of forgiveness, of letting go, took me well on my way to fulfilling the first step on the noble path to enlightenment. I have gained insights from the words and examples of friends, and they have often pointed the way to hidden truths. Is this experience universal? Can it be that our community here at UCE is our Sangha? Is the person you are sitting next to? 
or with whom you have volunteered on a committee or the garage sale, a testament to our shared strength and wisdom. Do each of us in our own way embody aspects of Buddha's eightfold path so that we collectively walk a path of wisdom and compassion? Are our thoughts and actions more aligned with ancient Buddhist teachings than we might realize? I'd like to test that hypothesis, if you will indulge me. The first step on the Eightfold Path is right understanding. My Sangha helped, has helped me understand the nature of reality and the truth behind the Four Noble Truths. I will now enumerate steps two through eight of the Eightfold Path and invite you to consider the many faces in our community, our Sangha, who embody the virtues encompassed by each of the steps that lead to enlightenment. Think of those among us whose actions, words, and intentions are inspirational, each reflecting a measure along this noble path we walk together. Right intention, the second step of the Noble eight foot pa Eightfold Path. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who acts with kindness and compassion and encourages forgiveness and understanding. The third step, right speech. Reflect for a moment on a friend or member of our community who speaks truthfully and honestly, using words to inspire and uplift others, and who maintains silence when words could cause harm. The fourth step, right action. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who helps others without expecting anything in return, who promotes harmony and goodwill and practices nonviolence and respect for all life. The fifth step, right livelihood. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who has chosen work that contributes positively to society and supports fair dealings and sustainable practices. The sixth step, right effort. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who cultivates positive qualities and virtues persisting in self-improvement despite challenges and encourages others to pursue personal and spiritual growth. The seventh step, right mindfulness. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who is fully present and engaged in the moment, maintaining a calm and balanced demeanor while encouraging deep listening and understanding in conversations. The eighth step, right concentration. Reflect for a moment on a friend or a member of our community who engages in regular meditation or prayer and supports others in their meditation or contemplative practices, inspiring tranquility and focus in challenging situations. So many faces and names and memories come to mind, and I am so thankful to this community for all have, I have learned and have yet to learn. In our congregation, we might not individually embody all the practices of the Eightfold Path at all times, but collectively, as a community, 
we reflect these profound teachings. Each one of us contributes uniquely to the whole, creating a mosaic of virtues and good deeds that align with the Buddha's teachings, even if it is not explicitly labeled as such. We seem to be guided in the Buddhist way, not by any single individual's perfection, but by our combined efforts, compassion, and wisdom. This is the true essence of the Sangha, the community which we hold dear. Like a jewel, more precious than rubies, our community enriches us, supports us, and provides a foundation from which we can grow and learn. In this light, we see that our cherished community is not just a gathering of individuals, but a vibrant Sangha. As we support, teach, and uplift each other, we live the path of the Dharma, collectively moving towards greater understanding and enlightenment. This realization underscores the value of community in our spiritual and everyday lives, showing us that together we are indeed walking in our imperfect and still searching Unitarian way, the noble path laid out in Buddhism. Our next hymn is number 1058, Be Ours a Religion. We will sing it through two times. You're invited to rise and sing together. Hymn 1058. Are, that hymn is, the words are from Theodore Parker, in case anyone is familiar with that name. So we've talked about Buddhism. Let's practice a little bit, shall we? The main tenet of Buddhism is quieting our minds and hearts. And as we do each Sunday, um, let's do that together. Let's take a couple of long, deep, cleansing breaths, settle ourselves into our chairs, our beds, our couches, the floor, wherever you are watching this service. And with me, take a couple of long, deep breaths in and out. In and out. See if you can make some noise while doing it. In and out. Once more, in and out. And let all of the air go. Allowing room for the new to come into your body. Pushing out all that is old, all that we no longer need. I invite you to allow the gravity to take hold of your body and let yourself imaginatively sink into the chair, your bed, your couch, your floor. See if you can imagine yourself becoming one with the floor, with the earth, feeling it envelop you. I invite you to follow the, your breath as it enters your body 
and goes into your lungs where, where our bodies take what we need and then let go of everything we no longer need. I invite you to breathe into any spots in your body that are tense, that are painful, and allow your cleansing breath to melt them away. Let us share about 90 seconds of silence together, after which words will come up for our meditation hymn, filled with loving kindness. Before I begin, I would just like to thank you for that amazing service leader reflection. I was deeply touched and I just, it was great. Thank you. Calm in the midst of chaos. I titled it that because I expected the sanctuary to be full of garage sale stuff. <laughs> and it would be feel so chaotic. And so I thought, oh, I'll just use that. You know, be like intentional, but you guys cleared it all away and kind of wrecked my title. <laughs> but that's okay. And it's such congratulations to the team that did this. 
amazing job. Thank you. I know a lot of you worked really hard. Calm in the midst of chaos. In The Art of Happiness by His Holiness the Dalai Lama, His Holiness stated at the beginning of a gathering, I think this is the first time I am meeting most of you, but to me, whether it's an old friend or a new friend, there's not much difference anyway, because I always believe we are the same. We are all human beings. Of course, there might be differences in cultural backgrounds, differences in our faith, or we may be of a different color, but we are human beings consisting of the human body and the human mind. Our physical structure is the same, and our mind and our emotional nature is also the same. Wherever I meet people, I always have the feeling that I am encountering another human being just like myself. I find it is much easier to communicate with others on this level. If we emphasize specific characteristics like I am Tibetan or I am Buddhist, then there are differences. But those things are secondary. If we can leave the differences aside, I think we can easily communicate, exchange ideas, and share experiences. So who is Buddha anyway? The life story of the Buddha begins about 2,600 years ago in Lumbini, near the border of Nepal and India, where the man Siddhartha Gautama was born. Although born a prince, he realized that conditioned experiences could not provide lasting happiness or protection from suffering. After a long spiritual search, he went into deep meditation where he realized the nature of mind. He achieved the state of unconditional and lasting happiness, the state of enlightenment of Buddhahood. This state of mind is free from disturbing emotions and expresses itself through fearlessness, joy, and active compassion. For the rest of his life, the Buddha taught anyone who asked how they could reach the same state. India at the time of the Buddha was very spiritually open. Every major philosophical view was present in society, and people expected spirituality to influence their daily lives in positive ways. At this time of great potential, Siddhartha Gautama, the future Buddha, was born into a royal family in what is now Nepal. Growing up, the Buddha was exceptionally intelligent and compassionate, tall, strong, and handsome, apparently. The Buddha belonged to the warrior class. It was predicted that he would become either a great king or spiritual leader. That, that certainly came about, didn't it? Since his parents wanted a powerful ruler for their kingdom, they tried to prevent Siddhartha from seeing the unsatisfactory nature of the world. They surrounded him with every kind of pleasure. He completely mastered combat training, even winning his wife. Somebody knows how to say this properly, I apologize. Sadodhara in an archery contest. Suddenly, at age 29, he was confronted with impermanence and suffering. On a rare outing from the palace, he saw someone desperately sick. The next day, he saw a very old man in physical pain, and finally, one day, a dead person. He was very upset to realize that old age, sickness, and death would come to everyone he loved, including himself. Siddhartha had no refuge to offer them. The next morning, the prince walked past a meditator who sat in deep absorption. When their eyes met and their minds linked, Siddhartha stopped mesmerized. In a flash, he realized that the perfection he had been seeking outside 
must be found from within, from within the mind itself. Meeting that man gave the future Buddha a first and enticing taste of this mind, a true and lasting refuge, which he knew he had to experience for himself, for the good of all. So he decided he had to leave his royal responsibilities and his family in order to, in order to achieve full enlightenment. He left the palace secretly and set off alone. Over the next six years, he met many talented meditators, meditation teachers, and mastered their techniques. Always he found that they showed him mind's potential, but not the mind itself. Finally, the future Buddha decided to remain in meditation until he knew mind's true nature and could benefit all beings. After spending six days and nights cutting through the mind's most subtle obstacles, it is said he reached enlightenment on the full moon morning of May, a week before he turned 35. At the moment of full realization, all veils of mixed feelings and stiff ideas dissolved, and Buddha experienced the all-encompassing here and now. All space in time, all separation in space and time dissolved, disappeared. Past, present, future, near and far, melted into one radiant state of intuitive bliss. He became timeless, all pervading awareness. It is said that through every cell in his body, he knew and was everything. He became Buddha, the awakened one. After his enlightenment, Buddha traveled on foot throughout northern India. He taught constantly for 45 years. People of all castes and professions, from kings to courtesans, were drawn to him. He answered their questions, always pointing towards that which is ultimately real. Throughout his life, Buddha encouraged his students to question his teachings and confirm them through their own experience. This non-dogmatic attitude still characterizes Buddhism today. Buddha said, I teach you because you and all beings want to have happiness and want to avoid suffering. I teach the way things are. So what are some of the teachings of Buddha? One of the phrases I like is, the Buddha says, pain is inevitable, suffering is optional. What I like about this is that none of us gets through our lives without experiencing pain and suffering. It takes a very evolved person to be able to experience emotional and or physical pain and not suffer. The teachings of Buddha are aimed toward enlightenment, the attainment of non-attachment. Non-attachment does not mean we hold people at arm's length. <coughs> Sorry. Far from it. It allows us to move more freely. Maybe it's like using a helmet and pads when we go skateboarding or rollerblading. You, you feel a little freer to open up and just go for it. The teachings of Buddha are called Dharma teachings. He wrote a lot, and scholars have been trying to learn from and interpret them through the ages. One of the main things about Buddhism is for us to learn about ourselves. There are so many exercises and quizzes out there to learn about ourselves from, like, what's your Enneagram number, and what is your Myers-Briggs? Are you an ENFP or an INJ? Whatever. Right? So we, we're always taking this, these tests. I recently did one on ADHD. I might have a couple of ADHD traits. Most of these quizzes and thoughts are short-lived. 
The teachings of Buddha, along with meditation, when put into practice, do what we are all trying to do. Figure this stuff out. Who am I? What makes me tick? Who am I in relationship to one another, to our friends, to our sangha? Sitting in meditation alone or in a group or sangha can help us answer these questions. Often sanghas have teachers or experts that have studied under masters. When I meditate, I pay attention to what thoughts are pushing through. What is on the top of my mind? What's me? I'm just going to stop for a sec. I'm going in and out, I think. I could yell, but that won't be very nice. Like, speak loudly, not like yell at anybody. So I'm always wondering what's bothering me, what's on the top of my mind. And then I can say to myself, this is important to me. And maybe I can let it go for now. Or maybe this is important to me and I need to pay attention. Maybe there's something that I need to do. Maybe there's an, um, something I need to amend. Deeper in, sometimes we begin to discover those sticky places, those things that bother us. And there are practices to help us deal with those too. The main teachings of Buddhism are the Four Noble Truths and, as Team Turvey said, the Eightfold Path. The Four Noble Truths are the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, the truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. When thinking about how to end our suffering, we must consens confront our own sense of the I, our ego, as it were, and come into alignment with all things. We kind of have to leave, lose our sense of importance, in other words. Buddhism suggests that studying the Dharma and the Eightfold Path is the path to alleviate that suffering. The Dharma can be thought of as a wheel with eight spokes, each spoke representing one of the noble paths. These paths are right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And those were broken down for us a little bit earlier. I think it is fair to say that what is considered to be right would be thought of as equal justice, respect, having good boundaries, and living with compassion and kindness. Compassion extends to ourselves, others, and all sentient beings. Learning just this little bit about Buddhism makes very clear how well the Four Normal Truths and the Eightfold Path can be very compatible with our principles and sources. Many Unitarian Universalists also consider themselves to be Buddhists, or they follow the way of it is, that it is said that the teachings of Buddha could be boiled down to this. Not to do any evil and to purify heart. Practicing Buddhist virtues in our everyday lives can enhance and enrich our lives so very much. The whole idea of personal and our spiritual growth is becoming self-aware, to get control of our ego, to live kind and compassionate lives. And this could make for a lot of satisfaction and happiness. Although I'm not advocating for us all to all of a sudden become Buddhists, I, it's, but it's not a bad idea. I think the main idea of all of this is to simply become our best selves, to be clear and honest with ourselves. Sometimes I talk about or think about how, how important it is for us to finish our thoughts and to question our intentions. 
those are two things that I have found difficult in my own personal journey. And also to discover all those things that could be hidden from us. We've earlier talked about the Jahari window and how part of our work as human beings is to discover those things that others can see about us but we don't know. And all those things about us that maybe we don't know and no one else knows. So our work is to dig deep and go into ourselves and figure out who we are. That is personal and spiritual growth. Buddhism is one way of helping us do that work. And if you are interested in learning more about Buddhism and you haven't really dove, in, dove into it, uh, I suggest you might start with um, the author and lecture teacher Pema Chodron. She's an American Buddhist nun. I believe she lives in Halifax. Um, and has many published books, and you can find her on the internet very easily. I have several of her books, and I do have a lending library if anyone wishes to take a book. That would be great. All we are are vessels that we fill up and empty out of air every few seconds. As we pay attention to the workings of our mind and our breath, we can increase our awareness learn how to be kind, and fill ourselves up with compassion. All very worthy endeavors indeed. So one last time I ask you to focus in on your breath, to still your body and quiet your mind. And each time your mind wanders, gently bring it back. You might label it thinking or worrying. Just bring it back. Be gentle with your mind. I invite you to do this for a couple of breaths while the tech folks get the video we are about to experience up and running. The Dalai Lama is going to grace us with uh, one of his favorite prayers. He said, and I invite you, he repeats the prayer, I invite you to speak the prayer aloud with him if you are so moved. In keeping, as we keep this spirit of gentleness and compassion in our hearts, I invite you to light a candle of joy or concern. We have two stations open. I invite you to light a candle if there is something on your heart and on your mind that you wish to light a candle for, something that you just might need to let everyone let your light shine to share your joy and concern. The tables, the stations are open. I invite you now.
And I invite Lynn to light one last candle for all those joys and concerns we hold in our hearts that we might not be quite ready yet to make visible. Let's just take a second and notice the beautiful lights. Each one represents a person, a thought, a disappointment, a heartache, a celebration, a joy. We are lucky to have such a wonderful sangha full of the entire gamut of emotional and human expression. Let us be grateful and thankful to be together this morning. And as we make our way into our week ahead, may we sing together the closing hymn, Come and Go With Me in that land. We don't have a whole lot of Buddhist hymns in our hymn books, so we just make do. But it's important to end with a bit of a rouser, so uh, I invite you to rise in body or in spirit and sing together hymn number 1018. I invite, sorry, I invite Sylvia to come forward and extinguish the chalice as I read this Tibetan Buddhist prayer. Excuse me. <clears throat> May you be at peace. May your heart remain open. May you awaken to the light of your own true nature. May you be healed. May you be a source of healing for all beings. I'd like to remind everyone that the AGM will happen right after the service, so grab a cup of coffee and then come back into the sanctuary. And I'd also like to thank everyone that took part in this service and contributed and put all of us that put our brains together and our talents together and, and created this service this morning. There was one other thing. Hmm. It'll come to me when I don't have a microphone. Okay, go in hope. For the arc of the universe is long and we can bend it toward justice and go in strength. For together we can confront injustice in our daily lives and in the larger world and go in love. 
most importantly, go in love. For a holy and generous love is both the reason and the means by which we transform our world. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And let us gather in a crazy-looking circle and sing together our linking songs.